Good evening and welcome to our special presentation of the documentary Understanding Joy, The Devastation of a Gambling Addiction. I'm your host, Yolanda Vasquez. With the growing number of casino-based gambling opportunities available in Maryland and nearby out-of-state locations, problem gambling has become an epidemic. There are an estimated 150,000 problem gamblers in our state alone. Last year, the American Psychiatric Association reclassified pathological gambling as an addiction, a revision reflecting new research that helps us to understand its effects. To explore this, Academy Award-winning filmmaker Susan Hadari and John Anglum produced a revealing documentary on the destructive nature of gambling addiction. It features Joy, a woman whose addiction overcame her sense of morality and drove her to embezzle large amounts of money from her employers. Throughout the piece, she struggles to explain her disease to her children, to the world, and more importantly, to herself. Our one-hour special will also feature live interviews with experts and a call-in phone bank with counselors who are trained to respond to viewers' questions or requests for help. The phone number to call is on your screen. Or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. We'll be back to discuss more, but for now, here's part one of Understanding Joy. devastating gambling addiction controlled her. I would, I would take my paycheck and go up there and lose every penny of it in an hour. Her need to gamble grew more intense, overpowering her sense of right and wrong. And so I started taking money from the company I worked for. And I'm going to hit, I'm going to put it right back, you'll never know. But Joy can only keep taking. Her brain's been hijacked by her addiction. I knew I was in deep, deep trouble, and I was going to pay a huge price. Without even realizing she had an addiction, Joy has gambled away her life. And she called my daughter and told her. I will never forget the look on her face. You did what? Again. I've destroyed so many people's faith and and I've betrayed so many people and I've lied to so many people and it's a horrible addiction. It's horrible. It's insidious. there's been a word developed yet to describe the pain, the damage, the betrayal, the, the guilt, the shame that goes with it. You know, you hide something for so long. I just went up there and did what I did. Nobody knew where I was or what I was doing, and if they asked, I lied. My understanding is that your lawyer wanted me to meet with you to do an evaluation for the court? Yes. Okay, great. I, Why don't you just kind of start with where that started? I worked for a company for a little over five years. I was stealing money. I was embezzling funds from them all those years, and I got caught. I'm facing very serious charges, jail time, but it's all due to this gambling addiction. I just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. I couldn't stop. I knew it was wrong. But what, what are the rough amounts we're talking about? It is an astronomical number that I personally don't believe is correct, but um, they're saying $700,000. So what, what kind of gambling were you doing? Slot machines. Okay. Pretty much exclusively? That's it. Okay. We know that in the brain of folks who compulsively gamble, that part of the natural reward center of our brain is sort of hijacked by the behavior. The brain is craving this rush, which it can't produce on its own after a certain point, and it needs the person to get it externally from the gambling behavior. So now 
that sense, it's like a, being a, a drug addict. It's like sitting at the slot machine and being hooked up to an IV morphine drip. They can just kind of block out everything. They almost, it almost becomes trance-like. It's the only time I was comfortable. There's like a bubble around me that protected me from everything outside of there. I didn't care how I got the money. I just wanted to be there. I mean, where else can you go and be in your own world and sit down at a machine and just take a deep breath and I just relaxed. I was home. I was away from reality. And a glass of water. Okay, I'll go get that. Hey, hey guys, I got an order. That's a job. Order up. I've always done this on the side to supplement my income. There you go, dear. But now it's my only income. You need anything else? Thank you. You're welcome. You don't think you have a problem. You don't want to believe you have a problem. I got to give this up. Even though everything you're doing is crazy. Another addiction. Staying out for two and three days to gamble. Driving up and down the road to get money to gamble. I mean, these are pretty obvious signs that you have a problem. It's really a preoccupation with it. So people, even when they're not gambling, are strategizing. They're thinking about how wonderful it'll be to get there. And it's just constant obsessions with the behavior. I would, I would take my paycheck that I earned and go up there and lose every penny of it in an hour. And I would drive all the way back go get another check, go to a liquor store, cash it, and go back up there. That's sick. You know, it's really sick. The things that you'll do, the, the steps that you would take to, to fill that need to get your high. That was my high. The behavior has to be ratcheted up a notch. It has to, you have to gamble with more money. You have to take riskier gambles in order to produce the same chemical rush that you had when you started doing the behavior. And this leads to sort of a vicious cycle where the person really is sort of bound by their brain and they feel almost robotic. I've lost everything. I'm nothing. Some pots and pans I have left. Don't look at that, that's just a mess. And my bed and the TV. That's it. That's what my life is now, since I lost everything. I have a bed, a TV, and a few boxes in my clothes. I had to watch General Hospital. I had two-bedroom apartment. Come on, buddy. Just about every Sunday, my whole family was there. That's why I had that little bench there, and we would laugh and cook out and eat. That's gone. There aren't any more good get-togethers. We don't get together anymore like that. They feel betrayed. They feel, you know, I've lied to them for so long. And yeah, they're mad as hell. What's been going on? There's a lot of shame. Um, I'm embarrassed. I feel horrible for what my kids are going through and yet what's still to come because I haven't been sentenced yet. And, um... It's just, I just can't get over the fact that I did this and that I stole money and that it went against everything I taught my kids when they were growing up. You know, you don't steal, you don't lie, you don't cheat. So really, how did they go? Um, they just can't believe it. It's shock. My son, my oldest, he was really mad at me. Shock. Disappointment. But what about that number... But what do you think the real number is? I don't remember. I have screwed up their lives. Big time. It's almost a, a survival feeling drive for many people. That they feel that without it, they cannot go on. I would go by myself. And I would lie to people, not telling them I was going by myself, because I thought... 
they're going to look at me like I'm nuts. Why would you drive all the way up there by yourself? You know. So, and it just snowballed. It, and it got to the point where I was spending my rent money, all my bills. I, I, I just, I didn't care. And um, I was chasing it. You know, I thought, I'm going to hit it. I'm going to win. And I can pay all my bills. And so I started taking money from the company I worked for. And um, with every intention of, well, I'm just going to take this $200 and I'm going to hit, I'm going to put it right back. They'll never know. People in that situation often tell themselves, well, you know what, I'll take money, but then I'll win. I'll pay back the money before anybody notices and then everything will be fine. And people fool themselves into believing that because in part they want to gamble so desperately. Um, and they want it to be sort of consistent with who they are. A good person doesn't steal, but they might borrow. Well, then what happens is you lose and you can't put it back. So now you got to steal more money in order to try and win it back, steal more money. And so that spiral simply um, continues down the drain. You want french fries or home fries? So very good people, very moral people, are driven to doing things that are horribly immoral and illegal. You okay? And you get a salad, what kind of dressing? This will probably be my life, the re for the rest of my life, my job, my career. There you go, sir. Okay. Hot or cold? I don't know yet. I'd rather use my mind. I love working with numbers. But, you know, I'll never be able to do that again. <laughs> Who's going to hire a bookkeeper who steals? What? It's for you. Everything's cool. Have a good one. Thank you. What did he just gave me $40? That's crazy. He and I were talking about gambling. He's a gambler. He um, plays blackjack. And I told him that gambling, I lost everything. Maybe he just felt sorry for me. Isn't that crazy? What? Hello, I'm Yolanda Vasquez, and welcome back to our studios at MPT and our presentation of Understanding Joy, the Devastation of a Gambling Addiction. Are you or someone you know having difficulty with a gambling addiction? If you have a question or need help, we have a live phone bank of counselors who are here to provide you with answers. The phone number to call is on your screen, or you can simply email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. With me right now are Christopher Welsh, Medical Director from the Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and Stephen Martino, Director of the Maryland State Lottery. Thank you both for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. So, Christopher, let's start off by talking with you. You had to do an evaluation of Joy in the piece. Um, why did you need to do that? Uh, so her counselor, um, where she lived in Frederick, um, they, one, they didn't have a psychiatrist there that, that really knew about gambling. Um, but the, the main reason is that um, a lot of people with gambling problems also have other mental health issues. Like what? Um, depression, anxiety. Somebody who's manic depressive or bipolar, they may gamble a lot when they're in a, in a manic episode. Mm -hmm. um, so it was one to find out did she have any of these other mental health issues going on, as well as a lot of people with gambling problems also have other substance abuse issues. So that was the so. need for you to do the evaluation. Is that pretty mm -hmm. typical? Yeah. It is. Yeah, okay. because it's so often that people have these other issues going on as well. What did you discover about Joy's gambling addiction? What did you discover about her through the whole addiction process? Um, well, we'll hear more about it, but um, the, this had been something that had been going on for a while. She had dealt with it, um, you know, came back to haunt her. Um, it's not really clear how much she had um, other issues like depression beforehand, but certainly as this you know, started, it really kind of um, snowballed for her. 
Stephen, I'm going to bring you in the conversation. The state has been dealing with the repercussions of problem gambling for quite some time because we've had casinos that have been in nearby states, as we mentioned earlier, Atlantic City, West Virginia, and, and Delaware nearby. But now that the casinos are here in state, um, are you noticing an uptick in, in problem gamblers? Well, you know, most, most of that information would go to the operation that's run by uh, Dr. Welsh at the uh, University of Maryland School of Medicine. So they'll keep track of that? They, they do. They run the problem gambling uh, toll-free helpline number, so the 800-522-4700, which as the gaming regulator, we work aggressively to make sure that that information is out. And that's really our goal. We have, game, you know, we have oversight over the casinos in the state. Uh, so we set parameters, rules, and regulations. Uh, we make sure that before they open, they have a responsible gambling plan. We make sure that their employees are trained every year to identify people who may have a, a, a gambling problem, particularly on the on, on the gaming floor. Uh, and, and so that's really our role. But, you know, we're a full partner and we've really embraced a, a very aggressive um, a, a approach to interdiction and uh, awareness of responsible gambling and problem gambling. You and I were talking earlier, there was a prevalence <clears throat> study that was done back in 2010. This was before the casinos sort of hit Maryland hard. Right. Um, what did they discover then? Because one of the things I think people think, more casinos, a higher incidence of problem gamblers, but not necessarily. Well, my recollection from that study, which was done in the summer through the fall of 2010, so really only overlapping about a month from where the first casino in Maryland opened in Perryville in September of 2010, is that it showed an incident uh, within the population of Maryland at about three and a half or so percent of people who self-identified as problem gamblers. And then of that subset, about you know one percent who might be identified as pathological gamblers, but yet there were really no casinos in the state at that time. So clearly... Uh, you know, Maryland was having problems with, uh, you know, w with problem gambling um, that people, but people were going out of state. They were going to Delaware, uh, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, going up to Atlantic City, and they were importing a lot of the, you know, the, the troubles that they were having with problem gambling. I think another prevalent study will be done. I think the state plans to do one about every five years. So, you know, next year we'll, we should have some sense as to whether, you know, the introduction of more casinos in the state have uh, had an impact on the prevalence of problem gambling. You know, let's, let's talk, Christopher, we're going to go back to you and talk a little bit more about the Center, on, um, the center of Excellence on Problem Gambling. Um, it's sort of a one-stop shop, if you will, for gambling addicts. Tell us a little bit more about it and how it all came to be. Um, so the so Maryland was actually very progressive in the legislation that allows for casinos. Um, built into that was a certain amount of money goes into a fund to help people with gambling problems. So our center was started in July of 2012, mm -hmm. and the main things that we do we have a as Steve mentioned the 24-hour um, call center Hotline. where someone can call a spouse, somebody who's concerned, mm -hmm. a boss, if they, they were worried. Just out of curiosity, where is that number posted besides your website? Are there stickers anywhere outside of casinos and taxi cabs, places where problem gamblers may actually view it and say, hmm, maybe I should call this number? I didn't mean to interrupt, yeah. but just curious yeah. where it's they are. Every casino, it's actually in the back of every lottery ticket. And, and, and that's yeah. part of our, what our responsibility has been and how we have tried to spread the word about uh, responsible gambling awareness and, and problem gambling issues. Uh, we make sure that that uh, phone number is on the back of every lottery ticket that's sold in the state, whether it's a Mega Millions ticket or an instant ticket, a Kino ticket. Uh, it is also posted um, at all of the casinos. It's, you know, there's uh, pamphlets um, throughout the casino. It's part of all the advertising. Uh, if you listen to a, a radio advertisement or a TV commercial, from a Maryland casino, they're required to broadcast that number along with uh, the problem gambling um, website so that people can go and find help. Okay, so it's, it's visible. I mean, people who need help should be able to find it. Tell me a little bit more about the center, if you will, please, Christopher. Um, so we also do um, public awareness, which part of um, making this documentary was to, to find different ways. Last year we ran at different times different, um, you know, PSAs. Public service announcements on radio, on TV. Okay. Um, we also go around the entire state and train existing mental health and drug and alcohol counselors, many of whom don't know much about gambling. So we're trying to help them become more comfortable as we, you know, have people calling in. Then we can refer them wherever they are in the state to someone who's comfortable to work with them. Right. Um, we also are working on different prevention 
um, initiatives and all levels of education and you know young kids through college. Um, we so there's also a wide variety of things that you're doing. I want to get mm -hmm. back over to uh, Stephen if I can. I want to talk about programs that are in place to prevent problem gambling. One of them is called self-exclusion. Can you yeah. tell us more about that? So we see self-exclusion as a tool of personal responsibility that we administer at the Maryland Lottery and Gaming Control Agency. We know that there are people who have a, a, an issue with gambling. They know that they have an issue. And one of the ways that they're able to address that is by voluntarily excluding themselves from a casino. Uh, they sign up. You have to do it in person. You have to do it yourself. Someone else can't uh, sign you up, a family member or a friend. And when you agree to do that, uh, you uh, agree that if you're found on the casino property, you can be uh, charged with trespassing. If you win a jackpot, that jackpot can be confiscated. It actually goes to the problem gambling fund. Um, and But you're also then removed, your name is removed from all the marketing databases of all the casinos in the state. So no longer are you going to get the direct mail, uh, the, the birthday card with $10 of free play to come. Um, and again, it's a tool of personal responsibility. So far in the state, we've had uh, nearly 450 people uh, sign up for self-exclusion. Wonderful. 30 seconds left. Christopher, I'll let you have the last word. What would you like to say to someone who's battling a gambling addiction? Well, I, I think the main thing is to for them and for loved ones to realize that this is something that you can get help for, um, that you know, a lot of people feel very desperate and that they, you know, everything is kind of crumbled around them, but, but, um, but there are people that can help them and to call and we can help them find where to get that help. Thank you so much, Christopher Welsh and Stephen Martino. We appreciate your time. Thank That's you great. all very much. Thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. And remember, at any time, if you have a question or need help with a gambling addiction, we have a live phone bank of counselors who can speak with you. The number is on your screen, or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. And now, part two of Understanding Joy. Is this the first time you've had an issue with gambling? No. No, okay. So maybe go back. When, okay. when was the first time? Um, about 12 years ago. I did it. I did the same thing. I worked for a company, um, started gambling. When I stole money from that company, it was over a period of, I think, a year and a half. And uh, when I got caught the first time, you know, I went to court and I was given probation uh, and I had restitution. And that was about it. If somebody wants to abstain and then be in recovery, you damn sure better figure out why it is that you're doing what you're doing, or you guarantee that you're going to relapse or you're going to take on another addiction. Because all those forces at work that gave birth to the addiction in the first place are still there. You know, I knew what I was doing was wrong. But somehow in our twisted thinking, in our screwed up mind, we don't know it's a problem. I'll probably never understand why. You know, she pressed charges. You know, I went to a lawyer and I got uh, 90 days of house arrest, which I think I did about maybe 60 or 40, something like that. And it wasn't that bad. And that was about it. I just went on my merry way and I didn't, there weren't many consequences other than the restitution and I was on probation. And I guess I didn't gamble for about a year. I can't ever get the timeline straight in my head. But then I started again. But in this particular case, that initial involvement of the courts in her first experience with gambling, where I believe it was 90-day home confinement and a certain degree of restitution, well, that was handling it in a traditional way. But nobody recognized the addiction. Nobody recognized the problem. Nobody fostered a treatment plan, a recovery dedication for her as an individual to make sure that it didn't happen again. He is my best friend. I tell him everything, and you know what? He's never told one of my secrets. Not once. In, you know, almost seven years. That's a good boy. Come on, let's go. I started going again, and I started losing my whole paycheck, and I couldn't pay my rent and I couldn't pay my bills, and I lied to my boss. I mean, I, and I remember the first time I did it, and um, 
I was, I, I felt really bad, and I thought, why, why am I doing this to this person who gave me a shot? To him, I'm a piece of crap. I'm a liar, I'm a thief, and I betrayed him. They, they want me in jail, a long time. Uh, and then when you started again, besides the compulsion and, you know, having the problem, was there anything else out of the ordinary going on in your life at that time, five years ago? Well, I'd um, just broken up with someone who I thought I was going to marry. He found out about everything, about the time before, about getting in trouble, and um, it ended. And it was pretty um, hard to take. And so is that when you started stealing from yes. work and it got even more out of yep. control? So I went back to bartending, and then I, the man who owns the business that I, my last job, was, came in there, and he needed um, a bookkeeper, and he knew my story. He knew the lady I stole the money from, and he said, uh, you know what? I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a shot. You know, don't screw me over. Uh, a real hallmark of any addiction, including gambling addiction, is continuing to use despite negative consequences. Um, this is someone who, years earlier, had had the same thing happen, was caught by a previous employer, and obviously fired, had to pay restitution, and so this was not a new thing for her. You lose yourself, and you lose your sense of right and wrong, what's right and wrong. I'm an adult, I know that it's wrong to write a check that I'm not entitled to and take that money and go gamble it away. I know that's wrong. People will describe it that they know that they're violating their moral codes, that they're doing all of these illegal behaviors, but they're so, they're so driven and then so desperate. Because once you start going down the hole and you start recognizing that now you're 40,000, 50,000 in debt, then desperation sets in. And it's a survival thing. And why am I betraying him like this? But I didn't stop. I did it anyway, over and over and over again for years. Well, first of all, we don't diminish it. The man's trust was violated. He uh, hired Joy, uh, acknowledged her initial problem because he knew about her first offense, gave her a shot and asked her not to screw him over. Certainly, you cannot diminish the victim's anger. And I think there is a corresponding responsibility to the greatest extent possible of holding the defendant responsible financially and trying to at least make amends in terms of uh, what this, the victim has suffered. But there's a limit because, as you might well imagine in looking at the material in Joy's case, there's no way on God's earth she's ever going to be able to pay off half a million dollars or better. And we have to steel ourselves to understand that this is a perfect example of why prevention and treatment should be undertaken. And I think the reclamation of individuals uh, who are disease impaired, plus the bigger picture of trying to limit this problem in the future for a much wider array of people overshadows, and I say it again with all due respect to the victim, overshadows that particular circumstance. I knew one day I was going to get caught. Like I, I said, I had a little suicide bag I carried around with me. It was almost, please catch me. My boss said, oh, I don't understand why we're not making any money. Joy, let's look online at the bank statement and see where we're spending money. And that was it. I knew I was dead in the water at that point. He's never looked at bank statement in five years. And so I went back to my office grabbed whatever I could quickly and just ran out the door. I knew I was in deep, deep trouble and I was going to pay a huge price. And I knew there was a good chance that my kids would never talk to me again, my family, my friends. I knew it. I knew everything was just going down the drain at that minute and it was my fault. I ran up the street. I actually tripped and fell, and I was shaking, and I was crying. My heart was beating so fast, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. And my plan was go in this motel, take all these pills that I had been saving up for months and months, 
and die. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to die. Well, most of the data shows that approximately one out of four or one out of five people with a gambling addiction has attempted suicide. And that's largely in response to their gambling problems. And I think it's, 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 it's not completely surprising when one sort of considers how utterly devastating gambling addiction can be to the person, but everyone around them. You know, there's some, there's some evidence to suggest that a person with a gambling problem negatively impacts about eight to nine other people. And when you look at Joy's case, just think of it. Just think of if you involved yourself in some activity that you didn't like yourself for doing, that you were hurting others that you cared about, and you actually took the time to prepare a suicide kit. How, how absolutely astounding is that? That she was probably only a couple of clicks away from actually committing suicide. Welcome back to our studios at MPT and our presentation of Understanding Joy, the Devastation of a Gambling Addiction. During this broadcast, we have a phone bank of counselors who are here to answer your questions. Are you or a loved one feeling the effects of a gambling addiction? Simply call the number on your screen or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. With me right now is Lori Rugel. She is the director of the Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us, Lori. Thank you for having us. So what are your thoughts on the scenario that's being played out with Joy? Is, is this pretty typical of a problem gambler? You know, unfortunately, it is. I've seen many women with much the same issues, um, gambling starting later in life, not knowing what hit them, getting into legal troubles, doing time in prison, and these are folks who, you know, if they were overcharged at a store or got more change, they'd drive 10 miles back to return it. So very devastating for the family and the gambler. When does it cross the line? When are you just a social gambler who's just out having fun and then things go terribly awry as it did for Joy? Where is that line of demarcation and what are the warning signs? Yeah, I think the warning signs are becoming increasingly preoccupied, letting go of normal activities, family activities, birthdays, holidays, wanting to spend time with the gambling. Um, chasing losses. Mm. I lose and then I go back another day. Does a gambler always think they're going to win? If they go back another time, they're going to hit? It's always going to be different. Mm. And even with Joy taking the money, they don't classify it as stealing because I'm just borrowing it and I intend to pay it back. It's not like I'm going to use it for my own benefit. Right. It's just to tide me over till I get that win and then I can make everything right. And they lose control. I'm only going to gamble for a few hours and they're there the whole day. Only so much money. And they've gone to the ATM five, six times. And they lose track kind of in a brownout. Um, and they start lying and hiding and deceiving themselves and everybody around them. It's just a domino effect. One thing after another after another. Right. You're trying to cover up for this yeah. and making up, you know, lies sure. for this. Very deceptive. And the brain really changes the same way as it does with a substance use disorder. The brain patterns change and we have the research now that shows that so people get locked in and it's like dragging the brain out of that pattern of gambling, losing, getting depressed, and going back to gambling to try to make everything right. Yeah, it's very, very difficult. Joy talked about committing suicide as mm -hmm. a way out. H how yeah. common is that? About 20% of all folks with a gambling disorder have made a suicide attempt, so it's very common for folks with this disorder and you have to take statements about suicide very seriously because when things fall apart like they did for Joy it happens very quickly and you can be the best worker and a parent of the year in your community and suddenly it's hitting the headlines that you're a thief, that you embezzled and the sense of shame and guilt is so deep they don't see any other way out. Are there triggers in life that cause you to go overboard. She talked about how uh, she was in a relationship that kind of fell mm -hmm. apart um, sure. and there were other things that were happening in her life and I didn't know if somehow that just uh, ramps up mm -hmm. the gambling. Well, you know, I think any of us can be vulnerable given the right sets of circumstances and there's certainly a genetic component, 
but circumstances are important, especially for women. It's often relationship issues, um, problems in a marriage, in a relationship, losses, the death of a spouse, the death of a child, the death of a parent, um, those kind of grief and loss issues, or just traumatic events, being in an abusive relationship. Uh, rates of domestic violence are very high with this disorder, um, so a lot of different triggers. What information is out there in regards to um, gender difference when it comes to problem mm -hmm. gambling? Are women more inclined to become problem gamblers more so than men? Um, no, they're not. Being male still is a risk factor, but women are fortunately unfortunately are catching up and the pattern is different with women. Men often start earlier on and kind of get acculturated to gambling. Women tend to start later in life and their progression from social gambling to problem gambling can be very rapid. Six months rather than six years or 20 years like it often is for men. You've been doing this for a long time, Lori. Yes, Three I decades have. plus, if not more. Yeah. And one of the things I asked you about, what's the consistent characteristic of a problem gambler? And mm -hmm. you said their resiliency. Yeah, uh, you know, with the level of problems they're facing, like Joy presents, the level of debt, the level of family disruption, I don't know if I could get through that. But they cope, and the power of recovery to transform a person's life. So once you seek help, and reach out and realize that there is a pathway out. These people have wonderful, happy, joyful, meaningful lives, and they use the pain of their addiction to really develop compassion and understanding and a lot of strength. We've got about a minute left. You know, a lot of people will say it's very hard to sympathize with joy. Yeah. You know, she did this to herself. How could she not be anywhere but in a jail cell? Mm -hmm. What do you say to people who don't understand that this really is an addiction? Yeah, it, it's really hard to understand compared to putting a substance in your body. And I think the biology of it, that we know we have brain scans that show even one episode of playing slot machines changes brain patterns. So the behavior does the same thing biochemically to your brain that any addictive substance does and makes it just as hard to go through the withdrawal, through the cravings, through the tolerance that yeah. substances it's real. do. It's, it's real. It's real. It's very real. Lori Rubel, it was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming and we appreciate your time and insight. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. And if you or someone you know is struggling with a gambling addiction, please call our phone bank. We have counselors on hand who are ready to answer your questions and concerns. The number is listed at the bottom of the screen. And our counselors are standing by. Or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. And now, the conclusion of Understanding Joy. Today is called a pre-trial hearing. Again, I have to face my ex-employer and all his employees and his girlfriend and his accountant, and that's the hardest part. My stomach's in knots. I feel like I'm gonna throw up. Joy just found out we are assigned to Judge Dwyer in courtroom five. I'm meeting with prosecutor at 145. It took them about eight months, maybe nine months, to get a number, to go through all the checks and everything. They're saying $780,000. Uh, I know that that's not accurate, and it's probably, I'm thinking half that, but that's still phenomenal. You know, um, it, it might as well be 10 million. You know, it's just, it's not attainable. It, I'm not, never gonna be able to pay that back. The stares I get, and the looks I get, and the, oh. Not fun. There's the courthouse. Beautiful Frederick County courthouse. 
prosecutor made an offer of uh, doing 25 years, all but 10 suspended. And I think that's the max. And because I'm, it's a second offense. I'm thinking I'm scared. I'm not looking forward to this and the many other court dates I'll probably have. My lawyer just texted me and said, she's talking to the prosecutor. I don't know what that means. Maybe they're trying to come up with a deal. Send me away for five years instead of 10. It's an addiction, but it's difficult for people to understand that because they look at the, at the nature of the activity that Joy involved herself in. They look at the fact that it was a second offense in a period of years, and they begin to forget the fact that this is a disease. Instead, they look at it as a volitional, intentional act to, to benefit herself, uh, to harm others financially, and as a result, that's where the dichotomy comes in in society. Especially given that this was her second offense that she was caught, um, you know, no prison time, you know, just kind of go to treatment and, um, you know, we all recognize this is a disorder, but part of the disorder certainly for her was breaking the law in order to, to continue her addictions. And part of what society is having to grapple with is, is that an addiction? Or is that just someone who needs a punitive and deterrent approach within the criminal justice system? And that's the conundrum we face. All of these addictions are really brain illnesses. In general, we have quite a big stigma against addiction. We tend to think people should be able to control their behavior. Why is this person addicted to gambling, alcohol, drugs? Just stop. What's wrong with you? You know, I mean, just stop doing it. I don't do it. Why do you do it? I mean, that's the sort of general sort of approach. People look at the types of activities that gamblers involve themselves in. Uh, criminal activity, domestic violence, bankruptcies, foreclosures, uh, usurping their children's money, stealing from businesses. And they look at it as volitional, they look at it as intentional. Because there's no societal perception of gambling as a disease. So court is April 15th. Yep. And that's your sentencing? I don't Did know. I don't know. You might have a plea agreement by then, and they'll just agree. And How they came to some dis decision that they're going to try to come up with a plea agreement between now and April 15th, which is the next court date. They don't care how much or, or what, you know, they just want to put you in jail. That's pretty much what it sounds like. I'm trying to believe it's an addiction, and I couldn't help myself. But the shame and the guilt is so overwhelming to have to look at your family and say, I have an addiction, that's why I did this. That's why you hurt us, that's why you destroyed our family, that's why you destroyed your own life, because you have an addiction, yeah, that's why. That's not a good enough answer for people. So you keep feeling that you're a bad person yeah. because of that? All this because of gambling, you know? A slot machine has brought me to the point where it's just hard to look in the mirror and accept this is what I did. And, um, you know, I just keep hearing you're a good person, you just did a bad thing. Um, and I, I can't accept that. Your traditional judge will look at it as a repetitive criminal, will look at it as somebody who chose to take some steps to violate the law, not only harmed themselves, but harmed other people and businesses and otherwise who didn't deserve to be harmed and therefore we will punish, we will deter. You know, the judge isn't gonna look at me and say, you're, you're a compulsive gambler, you have a gambling addiction, I'm not gonna put you in jail, you don't belong in jail, you belong getting help and helping other people. That's not what's gonna happen. He's gonna say, you're going to jail, you're not giving me that crap that you're an addict. But I think that, you know, there's one thing about the, the criminal system plays out in its own way, but it should have at least enough understanding of addictions that appropriate treatment, if not in the prisons, but or as people are discharged from the prisons, should be implemented. Because we do know that if people don't get the right help, they're just going to continue to do the addictive behavior. And then the problem 
may resurface again with more criminal problems. So what I look at in terms of Joy's situation, it is the perfect example of what the worst case scenario can be with compulsive gambling. If you don't have prevention, if you don't have treatment, if you don't have recognition within the criminal justice system, you have society no better off than it was before because there's no guarantee there won't be a recidivistic activity. And what did that accomplish? But I just wanted so badly to know why, you know? But, you know, at the end of the day, I have to look in the mirror and it was me. It doesn't matter why, I think. It was me, there are decisions I made and for whatever reasons they are, I did it. I'm here. This is as low as it gets, unless you're dead. When he said 15 years, all suspended but eight, I know my face must have been utter, pure shock. That night when I was sitting in a holding cell in the county jail and I lost it. And that door just shut. Whew. Worst feeling, worst feeling I have ever had. I've been here almost five months now. It's sad, it's very, very sad. And what I've done and the things that I've taken from people and myself, I just, at times, don't even feel worthy of being here. I, I just, I feel like I would rather be dead than live in a prison. I wanted to be gone. I did not want to be here. And, oh, it was so bad. It's just, it's just, I can't even explain it. Coming here is because of a, an addiction. And not, not because I stole money, not because of what I did to anybody, but the bottom line is because of gambling. And it, yeah, it was really, really hard coming here. The world doesn't understand. No. Pretty compelling stuff. Well, welcome back to our studios at MPT and our presentation of Understanding Joy, the Devastation of a Gambling Addiction. I know it may not be easy, but if you or a loved one is reeling from the effects of a gambling addiction, now is the time to get help. We have a phone bank of counselors in the studio to answer your questions. Just call the number on your screen or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. With me right now is Michael Rosen, Network Development Coordinator from the Center of Excellence on Problem Gambling at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's good to be here. So let's first start off by asking you, what exactly do you do? Because when I asked you earlier, you sounded like you were a jack of all trades. It's like a utility infielder. <laughs> you do a little uh, bit of everything. A little bit. Uh, as, as you know, the, the Center of Excellence for Problem Gambling is not pro or anti-gambling. Our mission is to inform people about the possible dangers of gambling. In addition to that, very, very important, we train clinicians that their career predominantly was drugs and alcohol to the understanding. And, you know, you talked about the change in the DSM-5, that now gambling is recognized in the same category as alcohol and drugs, which opens up a whole door to this such hidden addiction. So this is my job is to get the message out, to network with people, to make people aware 
of gambling addiction. We're going to talk about your gambling addiction that you had that spanned several decades. But what did you think about Joy in the end with this piece? Well, I think, you know, Joy has come to a situation where she realizes what's happened. Uh, she wants to continue to help herself. She's even gotten a message across that she would like to start a GA, Gambling Anonymous, meeting in the penitentiary. Very good. And uh, through the the producers of this movie, they got to me, and on April 1st, we will have the first GA meeting in the penitentiary. That's wonderful. Yeah. Let's talk about your gambling addiction. What was that like to live with that day in and day out? And we're talking about from 1950s to almost to the 80s before you finally said enough is enough. Yeah, I gambled for 28 years. Mm -hmm. I started very, very innocently as entertainment, as an escape. Uh, you know, basically there are two types of gamblers. There's the escape gambler and the action gambler. Mm -hmm. I started gambling when I was 10 years old. I actually ran a casino in summer camp where we used baseball cards. I had a craft table and a blackjack table and a roulette wheel. And that very, very quickly progressed to by the time I was 13, I was in a poker game for money. And as years went on and the more money I made, the more intense the addiction became. What finally turned things around for you? What turned things around is I saw my life going to hell. Uh, I had my relationship with my wife fell apart. I had a daughter, adult daughter, that would not talk to me. Uh, I was in danger of blowing a career. And I started to go to the rooms, the Gamblers Anonymous rooms, and found there the support that I needed, the fellowship, and uh, actually was sober from 1981 to 2006. And then you had a relapse. Major relapse. But you're, you're better now. You're yeah, better five now. years sober. Good for you. Five years sober. Does it bother you that most people don't recognize gambling addiction as an illness? It, it bothers me in the sense because gambling today is 10, 15, and some people even say 20 years behind uh, alcohol and drugs. As a matter of fact, the founders of Gamblers Anonymous in 1957 22 years after AA was founded, the two founders in Los Angeles were recovering alcoholics. They had shifted their addiction, and that was 22 years later, and it's almost like those 22 years were still trying to catch up. Yeah, it's amazing. Understanding Joy focuses primarily on uh, gambling addiction, but there are other addictions out there, and you and I were talking early, and you said sports, sports. is huge. Right? Absolutely huge. Yeah. I mean, Joy was only into slot machines. Right. But today you've got, you know, horse racing for sure. And the gambling existed in the state of Maryland, the problems long before there were casinos. Mm -hmm. But you've got you you've you've got sports betting. Horse racing. Horse racing. Bingo. I never the thought lot of bingo. Of bingo. People don't think about bingo. Yeah. Even you know, lottery lady, tickets. Lady, you know, go out and she's going to church. Yeah, but right. She's, but it's, she's it's gambling. There. She's gambling. Yeah. And then the big one and the one that took me down was the stock market. Mm. And especially today with the advancement of the Internet, you can sit in your man cave or in your kitchen yeah. and you, all you have to do is with, with a brokerage outfit, you can gamble 24 hours a day. Yeah, no, no and human no one, contact. And no one knows anything mm, about none it. None the wiser. It's a hidden addiction. Yeah. I mean, there is no biological test. You can't take a blood test. Mm -hmm. To determine it. Although there is some type of genetic tracing and something that's hereditary. We were talking well, about that, it, possibly. It's po there is studies, and it's like shown. any other addictions, the child of an alcoholic has a better chance of becoming an alcoholic than someone who is not the child of an alcoholic. Of course. Of course. But it's nurture and nature, mm -hmm. and you never know, you know what happens. You've dealt with a lot of problem gamblers who've, who've sought help. Why is it so important to seek help? And can you beat this? You're, you're living proof, but is it difficult for some people? Well, those of us that believe in the disease theory, mm -hmm. we believe that we have a disease. I am a pathological gambler. Mm -hmm. I'll always be a pathological gambler. The key is not to be gambling. Right, in okay. the first place. And when I was gambling, I used to do everything I possibly could to increase my odds of winning. Mm -hmm. In answer to your question, there are some people that can go to a therapist and have individual therapy and it helps them. Some group therapy, some intensive outpatient, and some GA. The more you do, the better you have a chance of staying in recovery. Not recovered, staying in recovery. It sounds kind of harsh. I don't mean anything bad when I ask this question. But if you didn't get help, do you think that you would have ended up in the situation Joy is? In Possibly. Right I mean, I was fortunate. I never did anything illegal. Hmm. Okay, but I I definitely tested the waters, and it, you know it could have. 
could have easily lost my job. I was at one time uh, chief operating officer of a company trade on the New York Stock Exchange. And after retirement, all, when I had the relapse, almost blew everything I had. That's and the help, you know, I'm very much indebted to therapy and the rooms. Well, I'm sure that the center is glad to have you on their side. Michael Rosen, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your insight on all of this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Now, keep in mind, gambling addiction is a very serious problem. So if you or someone you know is dealing with a gambling addiction, there is help available. We have a live phone bank of counselors who can talk to you and answer any questions or concerns you might have. Simply call the number on your screen or you can email us at mdcepg at gmail.com. And if you're not ready to call now, that's fine too. We'll be here after the program is over if you want to place your call then. For all of us here at Maryland Public Television, I'm Yolanda Vasquez. Thanks for watching, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you.